robot dogs, bioharmonic beds, and an OLED TV that rolls up into its base. From the coolest gadgets at CES to the latest apps that will make your life easier, or at least more interesting, it's all here on the most irreverent tech show in the world. You may even discover what a bandersnatch is. Nope, it's not a robotic dildo. That's a completely different story. Confused? You won't be after this inaugural episode of The Bad Boys of Tech. Ready for your hot fix of tech news with the latest apps, sexy software, and groovy gadgets. You've got it with The Bad Boys of Tech. Take it away, gentlemen. Welcome to the bad boys of tech. We're not bad, really. We're just drawn that way. It's the podcast for tech nerds, geeks, dweebs, dorks, and those of you that might be technologically impaired. I'm Joel Kahn, New York Times bestselling author and eternal 12-year-old. And along with me, Mr. Travis Wright. Yes, Mr. Joel Kahn. It is a pleasure to hear, be here with us. We are having a party. This is great, right? Bad Boys of Tech, episode one. I am a marketing technologist. I am a uh, average selling author, not not New York Times, but I wrote a book called Digital Sense. And may, some of you may know Mr. Joel Kahn and I from uh, the Bad Crypto Podcast. You might, you might not. This might be the first time you've heard us and you might be tuning out already, but you might be sticking around because there's another bad boy in the house across the pond. No, not the one in your backyard, the big pond, the Atlantic Ocean. It is the one, the only Stuart Rogers. Hey, Stuart. Well, hey, Joel. Hey, Travis. Um, It's awesome to be here. I mean, you know, sometimes I am across the pond. Uh, I'm a journalist. I write for tech publications like VentureBeat, um, the uh, Grit Daily, uh, and many others. Um, I'm also not an author yet, but I have stood outside the New York Times building. And, uh, you know, I say I'm occasionally across the pond. I'm also a digital nomad. I get to travel around all over the world. I move from country to country once every five days on average. So sometimes I'm over your side and I know that the TSA is on high alert whenever that happens. <laughs> why is that, Stuart? I'm just curious. Well, because I'm a bad boy of tech, Joel. Oh, That's why. You, you're so, like you're so bad. <laughs> So what, why are we doing this show, guys? What, what's the deal here? You know, I think this is a convergence, right? So, you know, Joel and I, we do bad crypto. But then also Stuart and I, uh, you know, spent a couple of years doing the Venture Beat VB Engage podcast. And we were always talking about ramping that back up. And, and then we were, then we've had some pretty good success with bad crypto. And, you know, we chatted. We said, hey, what about, what about joining all of us and having a, a bad boys of tech threesome every week? Mm. So if Bad Crypto and VB Engage got together and they had a uh, a, a one night stand, mm -hmm. this podcast is is what would uh, come out <laughs> as a result. Uh, let's uh, let's all give a little bit of our backgrounds in tech just uh, briefly. I've actually been a tech nerd my whole life. I went to my first CES when I was working for a video store in Northbrook, Illinois, a junior in high school in 1981, and this is the era of the Atari 2600 and the VHS tape. And my employer asked if I wanted to go to the Consumer Electronics Show at McCormick Place in uh, Chicago. And I, it was like, Disneyland, you know, for for tech geeks. Um, and so I've been to many CES shows and I love gadgets. I love playing with all the latest toys. And uh, that's why I'm here. Why are you here, Travis? I, I got a question about that real quick, though. So was that like an additional ancillary CES? Just, oh, let's have one in the Chicago area, too? Because I thought no, that was... That was before it was, um, you know, in Vegas. All before the they moved to Vegas. Nice. Oh, yeah. That's like yeah. seriously old school. Yeah. Nice. They just Absolutely. recently had their 50. This is, I guess this year was the 51st CES. Very cool. Yeah, but not, but not always in Vegas. But not always in Vegas. Very cool. Yeah, so I'm Travis Wright. Uh, as mentioned earlier, I'm an author. I am also the co-founder of CCP Digital, which is an ad agency in uh, the Kansas City area. Uh, we got clients all over. And as a result of the Bad Crypto Podcast that Joel and I host, uh, we've been working with a lot of different blockchain projects. We work with a lot of marketing technology projects as well, different kinds of clients. I am a marketing technologist, as is Mr. Stuart Rogers. 
And uh, you know what? I started out with tech, you know, way back in the day. I think, you know, I got on the not quite as old as Mr. Joel Com of getting on with the, you know, those computers. But I think my first computer experience was with the Apple IIe in like second grade or something, third grade, playing Lemonade Stand and all that stuff. And then in my junior year, uh, I was in the computer class and I was, you know, we were we were learning basic language and my computer teacher just sucked. And I was like, you know what? I'm getting out of here at the semester. I'm going to come back to technology later on. This is, you know, this is way too slow. And I, I have no, I have no patience for this. And, um, that was like 90, 1990. And, uh, then you went to the army, uh, as a Russian linguist in the U S army, and then went to the university of Kansas. And then I got on super fast internet and I was like, Oh my gosh, this internet stuff is amazing. And within the first 36 hours of being online, I had uh, learned HTML, built my first website, set it up, and uh, was was on the races. And so since then, you know, I've done SEO, paid search, mobile marketing, social media marketing. I was the global digital strategist for Semantic for a couple of years. And uh, I love the technology. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, how, how long is this episode going to be? Travis? But not as much as you, you see. I didn't know. I didn't know we were doing our whole bio, Travis. I mean, give me ten minutes, and and I'll uh, I'll jump back in. You said just say some things, and so I did. I didn't you know did, when to stop. You, you said words and things and stuff. I bet Stuart knows when to stop, though. Stuart, tell us about your background <laughs> in tech. So I started out at the tender age of six. I was programming computers. Um, I actually had my first two video games published when I was twelve. I then ran a number of software companies. Um, in the background, I was also running a video game news website uh, that gave all of its money to charity. And we had approximately 50 young journalists come through the program and learn how to become journalists and uh, go on to get paid video game journalist jobs. Um, I got an opportunity to move from the wonderful world of tech into full-time journalism, um, joined VentureBeat, not just as a journalist, but also an analyst running BB Insights. We analyzed marketing technology. Although Travis likes to label me as a marketing technologist, uh, I have moved on from that world. And these days, um, I have gone back to artificial intelligence. I say back to uh, because I was developing AI applications uh, when I was 12 or 13 years old. Uh, so that's a long time ago. I'm 148 years old, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and I am involved in augmented reality and blockchain technologies um, and all of the emerging tech. Uh, that is my field of joy. Uh, these days, um, and also these days, I don't just write for VentureBeat. I write for many other publications and lots of other companies as well. Um, I also get to stand up on stage and talk all about how technology is affecting our daily lives. Um, and that's my background in tech. Hopefully, it was a lot quicker than Travis. And you're still an analyst, right? Okay. Well... You know, uh, Travis, if, if you if you want to pronounce it that way in order to get a cheap laugh out of the audience, I, I, I feel that's fair game. I mean, that's good. I could hey, you do know. a cunning linguist, but I won't do that. Oh, my. And we are the bad boys. And uh, I think that's the perfect segue to our first story. So let's get into the news. So our first piece of news kind of ties in there with that bad joke. Uh, so this robotic dildo was banned. <laughs> <laughs> from from CES and, and apparently the, it it won an award. The CES you know organizers they gave her an award for this m personal massager, the Ose personal dildo, and <laughs> then they took it away from her and and uh, prompted some serious sexism claims. And I heard that you actually went by the booth, Mister Jolcom. Yeah, so I was at the uh, Steve Leon's Showstoppers event, which is a um, a separate event that just takes place current concurrently at CES. And he brings in media from all over the world, and he has about 140 booths that are sponsors. And while um, these guys from OSE, I think it's pronounced O-S-E with an accent aigu on it for Frenchy French, um, they had a booth there, and the founder, Laura Haddock, was telling me about the story that their Osei personal massager was selected as a 2019 Innovation Award honoree in the robotics and drone category by the CES people, the Consumer Technology Association, otherwise known as the CTA. So somebody, you know, they looked at this and they gave it an award and then they took the award back 
because it said it was immoral, obscene, indecent, profane, and not keeping with the CTA's image. So, so think about that. Somebody had to look at this <laughs> and say, this is innovative. We're going to give it an award. And then they took it back. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's, it's completely wrong. I mean, I, I understand um, that, you know, I understand for sexism claims. I mean, if this had been a piece of, uh, you know, if this had been a toy, an adult toy um, that was for men, I have absolutely no doubt uh, that they would have just let it, you know, ride, um, if you pardon the pun. Um, and, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I, I feel that. I mean, I heard a lot of commentary um, about this because this actually blew up all over the Internet. I, uh, I was in um, Berlin when I... Uh, saw this news. And, uh, you know, I really feel for them. I, I think, you know, CTA, I mean, they need to get with the program. I mean, there's there's lots of amazing people out there um, in this industry who are doing really awesome stuff. Um, you know, uh, Laura, Laura Haddock, uh, for example, she's doing amazing things. Stephanie Alice is doing amazing things in this industry. Um, you know, they all are, and they, they all deserve the recognition uh, that they should be getting. And for the CTA to come forward and say, here's your award, and then to say, oh, actually, we've had second thoughts. Um, you know, I think that's wrong. I think it's absolutely wrong. I fully believe that they should, uh, you know, do something good for their PR and basically say, hey, we thought about this. We were wrong. Here's your award back. Yeah, I got to say, they, to they totally fucked that dildo company. <laughs> oh, damn. No, no, but what's so weird about this was like in 2016, the there was a, a company, Oh My Bod. Mm -hmm. They won the digital health and fitness product category in 2016. And then last year, there was literally a sex doll for men that was launched on the CES floor and a VR porn company that exhibits there. But I don't think they won awards, but there was already precedent with the Oh My Bod, the, the Kegel exerciser thing. Uh, and so that won. And so it's kind of strange that they would they would totally pull the award like that. It's definitely sexist. And I think that's I give it a thumbs down. Mm. And and I think this uh, this company that makes food is uh, Meatist. Uh, they are making the impossible burger and they're making it so real that even a vegetarian who wrote this article for CNET is grossed out by it. <laughs> too cowish <laughs> um impossible burger I, I love it um you know when i when i go to the states uh, there's quite a lot of restaurants now that have the impossible burger um it used to originally be uh the umami chain um i'd go to the one in, in santa monica i really like it it's it does taste like meat it does uh, have the same texture it even slightly bleeds i mean i, I you know i'm guessing that they use something like uh, beetroot or whatever so when you, you cut it open there's something you know a little bit of something uh, slightly red that comes out yeah, the, the Impossible Burger 2 apparently takes it much, much further, way further. And uh, it really does uh, completely feel like and taste like uh, meat. You know, I, I wonder, I just wonder if it's gone a little bit too far. I mean, this this particular person, uh, you know, the, the, the chap that, uh, or woman that wrote that article, uh, uh, says that they would, you know, basically sick, um, and you know, maybe that's maybe that's a little bit too far. I mean, I mean, what is it with actually trying to make something that is basically meat, but it's made out of vegetable products anyway? Why not just make something that tastes really nice out of vegetable products and out of plant-based food? Why does it have to be like a burger? I agree. Just just eat your veggies. Why? <laughs> what are we trying to do? What What's the conformity here? I really want it to look like I'm eating a burger. Uh, I want to fit in with the rest of the everybody else that's having a burger. I don't get it. Well, people want to, you know, be they're conscious of the environment and conscious of, you know, how bad that, you know, cows are for the earth when when you're just feeding them all this stuff and then all the gases that they emit and all the horror that goes through whenever they go through the slaughterhouse. But I mean, I still love beef. I love a hamburger now and again. So I think this is a really cool thing. And I tell you what, I've been to that same one, the umami in, in Santa Monica. And if you did not know that it was an impossible burger and you just ordered a burger and they brought it to you, you would not know that it's not beef. That's serious. And I don't, I've not tried this, this, the second version of this, but I thought it was pretty good. Actually, I, what I didn't like, I didn't like their ketchup. They had some weird spicy stuff in the ketchup that was kind of gross. That's what I took away from them. I'm like, Ugh, can I have some regular ketchup? But, uh, 
I thought it was delicious. And you know what? If it's better for the environment and it takes away some of the violence and the whole slaughtering process of animals, I'm all for it. Uh, now, I'll be really impressed when they make, uh, you know, a vegetable out of meat. <laughs> Yes, the possible <laughs> broccoli. <laughs> I mean, look, let's take this just to its logical conclusion for a moment. Let's say that we stop eating cows altogether. Cows are, are not really at the top of the food chain, let's be fair. Um, what what used to they have? Let's, let's say we stop um, slaughtering cows for meat. Let's say we stop having them, uh, you know, basically getting milk from a cow. Let's say we stop that as well. Um, then what we're going to end up with is just, a whole load of cows and you know they're obviously going to breed do we spay and neuter them like cats are they going to be the new cats will cows be the new cats will the streets of istanbul be full of cows because we can't kill them anymore um what is going to happen can we miniaturize them can we have small cows can we have, can we have tiny cows can we can we bring back that famous reddit question can we say you know is it better to fight uh, 100 uh, duck-sized cows or one cow-sized duck <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know guys I think there's some that are objecting to this whole discussion <laughs> alright maybe you're right maybe, maybe we that, one, on. that one particularly sounded like it was objecting I, I do yeah. not know what that cow was doing when it was recorded but I, I'm not sure I want to know I, I want to talk about the most badass thing that I saw at CES the, the thing that made me go what and it was an LG product, of course, LG, a big electronics manufacturer of television sets. And their display, it, when you walk into the, the main area in the central hall, was what I could call like a tidal wave of televisions, these OLED TVs that were curvy. And of course, they were all stitched together to show one large picture. But once you go through the little uh, arch that they had created with these TVs, and you walk in, there were these a row of five. Um, uh, what are, they're tables? They're about I don't know, eighteen inches high, and about six five foot wide. I want to say, and out of these tables, TVs rolled up, literally rolled out of the table straight up to a sixty inch display. It's their new OLED roll up television and uh, you could roll it down when you're not watching it it was pretty mind-blowing i mean i'm gonna i'm just gonna be a little bit mildly controversial here uh i'm we've been talking about flexible displays and all this kind of thing for a while um they were at last year's ces they've been at various trade shows i fully appreciate what lucky gold star have done uh but Let's be completely frank. Um, not massively innovative, right? I mean, we've we've had flexible displays for a while. Um, it was certainly a super impressive display, um, and you know, I loved the way they put it all together and uh, the you know, the video they had playing on it, and it was really super impressive. But um, it's not innovative, right? I mean, we've we've had this stuff around for a while. Well, we we had it in like a, a small, what was it, a thirteen inch display this is like a full big screen television that isn't just a display it's a piece of furniture for your your room and you know i think you could have you could have this thing down you can have artwork behind it and you know you could actually enjoy your room without this big black screen just cluttering it up and then when you're ready to watch it yeah pull it out I mean, I think I probably have a different view to most people because I don't actually have a house. So there's no point in me getting one of these in any case. I'm quite happy with the 13-inch one. I can stick that in my suitcase. You got no feng shui, Stuart Rogers. I don't need feng shui. Yeah. I don't have a house. You got no feng, you got no shui. <laughs> and the feng shui is not I mean, when innovative. I walk down the street, I'm always having a bit of a shui, but I don't need the feng. It's going to be expensive, one thing I right? Think I mean, this is going to be pricey. Yeah, yeah that one thing I look at this is like, if this thing is, is down, I know my kids are going to like sit a drink there or like a book or there's going to, you know, and then I'm trying to like raise up the TV and then all of a sudden there's a bunch of crap sitting on the, sitting on the base, right? Like, could you guys get your crap off my base so I can lift up the TV? 
I, I don't disagree that uh, it might not be the most practical setup. I just thought it was super cool. And, and Stuart is right. The display they had set up there to present this was, you know, larger than life. You know, you hear angels singing ah! as these TVs are rising up from their base. And uh, people were pretty amazed by it. Yeah. What about that 219 inch wall TV by Samsung? Did you get a chance to see that? Out there? I actually didn't see it at the show. Um, I was in the Samsung booth. I saw tons of stuff. It was huge, just a massive booth, but I didn't see the wall. And I don't know how I missed it because it is. I mean, think about that. That is an 18 foot diagonal measurement on this television set. Does that impress you, Mr. Stuart Rogers? Look, you know, when I think of all these things, and I think of things like, you know, foldable, rollable, uh, throw it up in the air and watch it fall downable. You know, all of these different types of displays. I'm still thinking about the fact that there isn't any real innovation here. I saw somebody with a tablet that folds over. I mean, I think they wanted to call it a smartphone, but my goodness, that thing was huge. There's no way that was a smartphone. Um, you know, it looked really chunky and horrible. And I don't think anybody is ever going to buy one because it was awful. Um, you got these wafer thin displays that will look beautiful in the house. I'm certain of it, but where's the innovation? Where where is that? And you know, just in general, like why? I mean, this is the problem with tech in general. You know, like, coming up with solutions to problems that don't exist. We already have perfectly good serviceable serviceable televisions that cost almost nothing. And you can you know, buy them for a couple of hundred dollars, put them in the corner of a room and watch things in amazing quality. Why do we need a $60,000 display just because it's wafa thin? You know, I don't, I don't disagree. We were doing perfectly well with the horse and buggy. And why did we need a motorized car? I mean, you know, the horse and buggy got us from here to there. What do you need a what do you need an engine for? Come on, dude, you have to, you've taken that, you've taken that analogy way too far taking that allows you way too far you know that's not what i'm saying I, I know and i don't completely disagree how you know here's my biggest concern with technology as much as i love the gadgets is it connecting us better as human beings is it making us more human? Is it helping us to to accomplish more, to get more done so that we have the ability to connect with others in ways that we haven't? And, I, and I'm not sure that it's working us towards that, but, you know, we're all willingly going along with it here in the Matrix because the gear is fun. For sure. Now, we do have all of these show notes, all of these articles and photos of different stuff that was going on at CES at our website. It is badboysoftech.com. Also, I believe we have bad boys of dot tech. So either one of those, we don't have a, you know, this is the very first one. So it should be easy to find this piece of content on the site there. Wouldn't you say, Mr. Jones? I would say it'd be really easy. If you can't find it, then you don't have an internet connection or you don't know how to operate a web browser. And can I just ask, you know, ladies and gentlemen, Maybe. please, please, please go ahead and type in bad boys of tech dot com. You know, we called this podcast bad boys of tech and then it took 15 people, six people years to actually come up with that url so please honor the amount of work that they put into that and go to that url for us it's badboysoftech.com mm. he's not wrong about that it did take a long long time have you guys seen the new netflix black mirror episode bandersnatch you know i i have not because uh of the aforementioned having no house and uh enjoying life instead of watching tv programs <laughs> <laughs> wow well that, that wasn't condescending at all just you know yeah yeah you're so fun you're fun to have at parties Mr. well Mr. yeah Mr. Have, yeah you're just gonna... I, I am fun to have at parties uh, i'm not fun to stick in front of a screen uh that's not fun parties they're fun yeah. watching a screen not fun <laughs> That's true. That is true. I agree Black Mirror is, you know, an award winning series that is is very uh, dystopian in nature. And it looks at actually, Mr. Joel Com, CTA just took away their award <laughs> <laughs> because of, because of the name Bandersnatch. Yeah, they didn't like Snatch. It was it was not, it was not good. They, they don't approve. I have no reply to that. So I'll just keep going as though you never said anything. Um, yeah. So this is what's really innovative about this show. If you haven't watched it yet is this is a black mirror episode that is interactive. It's a first 
for television where you actually have choices that you make throughout the uh, the episode about what the character is going to do it's and it's reminiscent of the old books that were the choose your own adventure books you know where you would uh, come to a certain part of the page and it says you do this go to page 83 but if you do this go to page 194 and so the outcome of the story changes based upon how uh, the the reader of the book would make different choices and so they've applied this to this episode and uh, it, it's it's pretty darn clever i mean it was the first time i felt like this is really interactive television it's not just passive watching yeah now one thing i noticed about it is they have their story the plot is there the whole thing is there and if you choose one of the other ones, then they'll just go through that little that little narrative and then get you right back to it and make you do it over again, right? Because it wants you to, you know, you, there's certain things it wants you to do, and it, it, eventually you get to them, right? I, I thought it would be cool if it actually like, oh, you did this and you did that. Oh, the show's over. And the show, you, it only took you 15 minutes to watch it. This was actually you had to watch it. It was an hour and 30 minutes. And you basically go through even whichever ones you chose. It would go back and recycle because it wanted you to go down a certain path. So it wasn't quite like the the uh, choose your own adventure books where, you know, you could read maybe it's three pages and that story's over. This one takes you back and makes you kind of go over it again. But I did think it was very it was interesting. And you can't watch it on a regular TV. You have to watch it on a smartphone or a tablet or your computer because you have to be able to interact with some sort of. You know, input device to tell it which one you want it to do. So it does not work on your TV. If you try to watch it on your TV, it will tell you, it'll basically show you like a two minute trailer and then you got to go watch it on another what's, device. Yeah, I, ma I made that mistake. <laughs> um, what's really interesting is that uh, Choose Co., uh, which is the company that did the Choose Your Own Adventure books, is actually now suing Netflix over Bandersnatch. I don't really see like what uh <laughs> how they're even managing to do that um choose co was actually founded in 2003 well before they even existed well well before they even existed mm. um you had people like steve jackson and ian livingston uh who had the fighting fantasy books which were also choose your own adventure and you roll the dice and the the, the way the dice came out you went to a particular page and all that kind of stuff um you know I don't see them suing anybody over this. Uh, you know, Choose Co., I think they're on really thin ground there, but probably, you know, because the United States is the United States, uh, some judge somewhere will go, oh, yes, I think this is completely reasonable um, and give them millions of dollars. Uh, but, you know, it's it's kind of crazy. I mean, it's it's not even the same thing. It's a book versus, uh, you know, the technology that Netflix put in place to allow this to happen, which... I think it's smart. I think it's really cool. Um, I may watch it at some point. It's the kind of thing that uh, if it is available on download, and you'll have to tell me if it is for, for Netflix, I could uh, watch it on a flight somewhere. Well, you, you, it's not available for download because of the complexity of it. You would need to watch it, you know, with a connection, but it, it will work on your phone. But here's the legal basis for this. There is actually a federally registered trademark for the phrase, choose your own adventure that choose co-owns and in the beginning of bandersnatch the the character actually refers to um the the book bandersnatch which is a fictional book in the story as a choose your own adventure book so choose co is saying netflix is using its trademark phrase which without a license they're asking for 25 million dollars or netflix's profits from the show whichever is greater wow this is interesting to me because I remember those. I have a bunch of those, and it was originally set up by Bantam Books. And Bantam, I, ha I think I have probably 30 of those original Choose Your Own Adventure books in, in various, like a box in my garage. And uh, I love those books. And, and they said that they sold about 250 million of these uh, from 1978 to 1998. And then they stopped publication. And then in 2003, I guess these the, you know, these two people created Choose Co to release those books, and then did they did they buy Bantam? Or did they get all the rights to all of those? Because now they can sue. Is it just a is it just one of those plays where they did that so they could go out and sue people who did that, like building apps? And I, mean, stuff I, like that? I don't I don't know, but I'm, I mean I'm no lawyer, but 
once something becomes so prevalent that the words enter the lexicon of the language, such as, for example, uh, we have uh, to Google things, uh, to Google things with a lowercase g, because we've all accepted that it is such an important thing uh, to be able to say, I am going to Google this, but it is an entered the lexicon. And when you have something that is so popular, it enters the lexicon, a um, large amount of the time, uh, that right to have that as a copyrighted phrase goes away because it's just part of natural language. So I, I, I don't know, uh, because I'm not a lawyer, but I suspect that uh, if there's a sensible judge in the room, they'll probably probably it. Well, out. it's not. Maybe they'll tell them to shut your bandersnatch. <laughs> <laughs> it's not all the tech news that's fin to talk about, but it's what we got for you. And now we're going to talk about some of the cool apps that we've discovered. So here's a great article that, um, you know, people are using Facebook. We've been using it, and there's actually all these studies that come out about how it's it's messing with our mental health, right? Where all of the uh, all the different uh, feedback loops that are built in there, and we're all, all the dopamine. And so it says, hey, maybe instead of spending all your time on Facebook and Instagram, check out some other apps. And, you know, one of the apps that I really like, because I travel quite a bit as well, and I love to listen to audiobooks. So aside of aside from Audible, uh, Blinkist is is an app. Have, have you guys uh, ever played with Blinkist? I love Blinkist. I use it all the time. Um, <clears throat> Blinkist is awesome, and it gives me the ability to read in, in uh, air quotes. And I'm, I don't believe it. I'm actually doing the air quotes. Nobody can see me doing this. Mad doing it. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I know, it's crazy. Uh, I, it allows me to read um, books en masse very quickly. I'm able to get all of the concepts and ideas that are in the book uh, in 15 minutes. And I don't even have to read them because most of them have got audiobook versions. I can just listen to them. It's beautiful. I love mm-hmm. it. Yeah, I use that to, to find new books that I actually want to read the, or listen to the whole book. I'm like, oh, that was awesome. I need to dive more deep into that. It's, it's cliff notes for audiobooks, essentially. Yeah. And it, it's pretty brilliant. Uh, it, you know, it's unfortunate that it's paid. Uh, it's $12 a month, 70 bucks a year. But if you want to, you know, get a lot of the bullet points from content, the summaries quickly, it's, uh, it's a really good way to, uh, to go about it. Great. Cliff Notes is Cliff Notes is going to sue us yeah, now. Thanks Cliff. a lot. Everybody named Cliff is is going <laughs> to is going to sue us. Uh, here's one that I've downloaded before and haven't used. <laughs> but for those who want to use a learn a foreign language, Duolingo is used by 300 million people. Uh, apparently, it's a great way to learn a lot of different foreign languages. I actually like the app Memrise, M E M R I S E. The gamification of that is really great because I've been studying and learning Russian, and I really love that app. I liked it more than Duolingo. Duolingo is pretty fun, but, uh, yeah, good stuff. Well, which one, What do you use, Mr. J- Mr. Stuart Rogers, for your language learning? Yeah, uh, you know, I use, I use both Memrise and Duolingo, but I found another one which I really like, uh, which is worth everybody checking out. It's called Drops. Drops? I've used that, too. That's fun. You get a drop acid. While you're learning the language, it's really handy. The Bad Boys of Tech podcast yeah, that's not how does not works. condone the taking of illicit substances. Well, I don't anyway, and you guys can. So is that there's some other there's some other ones on there as well. You can check that out there. And a Flipboard, you know what? Flipboard is a great one. I we use that all the time for bad crypto. Uh, badco dot in forward slash flip, where we basically put in all the news around blockchain and crypto. There, that's a great place to really curate news and find new news that's relevant to your interest so I've a there's a great article here on social media examiner.com for those of you that use instagram there's a list of five apps here that can help embellish your instagram photos and videos um in a way that makes your fake social media appearance even faker <laughs> it, it is it's so handy as if it could get any fake I mean, let's be honest. Uh, there is some pretty cool technology, though, here. Have you looked at uh, the images of what some of these do? Yeah, you know, I have. Um, I, I think they're pretty cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I think most social media profiles are pretty fake at the moment, aren't they? I mean, I, I saw I saw something amazing recently. I'm sure everybody has seen this. Uh, certainly anybody that's on Reddit or uh, Imager or any of those sites will have seen this probably a few times over the years. But you know, that, an image of somebody hanging with one arm on an amazing rock face, and it looks like they're thousands and thousands of feet up in the air. And then there's a picture of somebody who's taking the picture of the person who 
<laughs> who's doing that. And it turns out that it looks that way, but their feet are actually on the ground because the rock goes around in a curve. <laughs> Wait, are you saying social media isn't real, Stuart? That no, I can't handle that. Am I am I saying that we all have perfectly edited lives? Am I? I don't know. <laughs> it is so true. I I'm a big fan of the moment right after the selfie. Right. It's like, I wish that we could have more of those because everybody's all, yay. And then right after that, like, ah, back to normal and hating everyone. Actually, That's- pictures of people that are editing their selfie. Right. So you take the picture, you've got the smile and then now you're looking at your phone. So we need a name for mm-hmm. that moment where somebody captures an image of you, you know, deciding, do I like this? Do I not like this? You know, am I disgusted with myself? Am I going to take 500 more photos because I don't have the right duck lips? You know, what's good? What am I going to do? So I think the, the shot after the selfie, I think we call that the trophy. Mm-hmm. And the the, <laughs> the one that's uh, the picture of somebody editing their selfie, I think we call that a shoppy. Nice. Mm-hmm. Or an Eddie. Coining, coining phrases. Well, regardless, uh, there's a list of five apps here. One of them that I've actually used is by the makers of GoPro. It's called Splice, and uh, it's a free app. So if you are taking vertical videos and, and photos, you can add them together. You can add music. You can crop. You can trim. Put titles in there, animations. It's it's basically a more sophisticated uh, iMovie to help you make videos you know, on the fly. And then you can put them on Instagram. Or you can download them and, and use them wherever else you want. It's, you know, there's just so many choices right now um, that it's overwhelming. I love that app, in fact. And what's cool about it is, is like if you, you know, you're out traveling and, you know, you basically can pop that app, that app open and, and it will grab it. It'll say, oh, should I create an, should I create a video from your last 24 hours? And I'm like, oh, yeah, boom. And it'll make a, it'll make a video. And most of the time. Very, you you don't have to do very little editing on those, and that video looks pretty solid. And there's so many different styles and effects, the music changes and stuff. So I am a big fan of Splice. I think that's a solid app. There's one more app I want to reference. It's actually it's a web app, but it also works on uh, on mobile, and it's pretty phenomenal. There's a lot of times that you've got a cool image of people, but you don't want the background because you want to you know do what Stuart says and you know make it look fake. Um, and this site it's called Remove BG, which of course BG is for background. And whether you're on mobile or desktop, you simply upload a photo and this thing does the best job it possibly can to remove the background and turn it into a PNG that you can download and then put, you know, put the subjects of your photo in whatever environment you want. Uh, And it works pretty damn good. It does work pretty good. I have been playing with this tool since it uh, was launched. Um, You know, I saw it uh, appear uh, and get a, started getting a lot of social media coverage. And then um, it got even more when somebody featured it on uh, Product Hunt and it's exploded. Uh, I think it's awesome. It does a really, really good job, super good job. Um, and it's a really fast and simple way of creating uh, images that have got a transparent background, which, you know, even with the likes of uh, the Photoshops and PaintShop Pros and everything else that are available, like Pixelers and Snapseeds and so on and so forth, um, you know, isn't always the easiest job in the world. Remove BG just does it in a in a snap. It's awesome. I actually have a question for you guys because you guys are using a lot of different apps. So now I can we can go and do Remove BG and we can take the background away. Now we have this transparent ping of whatever we wanted to pull out from that image. What apps do you have? An app that you guys use to be able to layer that ping on top of something else? Because normally I have to go into Photoshop on my computer to do that. Is there an app that you guys have found that makes it easy to layer images on top of each other and on one image on your phone? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, absolutely. I mean, on your phone you can use Canva, um, and there's nothing wrong with using Canva to put a background image down and then put your transparent image over the top. Um, you can use Pixlr; uh, that will do the same thing. Um, you know, so there's a whole bunch of, of yeah. different apps. In, in fact, you can you can grab hold of the mobile version of Photoshop. Why not just use that? Very nice. Well, I normally I, I love Photoshop. I don't mind popping it up on my computer. Normally, I have it with me, but it would just be handy in some cases to take like you know the bad boys of tech logo and then pop it on top of whatever we're sharing and we're sharing it out on on the socials, right? So 
Yeah, exactly. And and please, everybody, type this in really carefully. It's remove.bg, not to be confused with remove.bc, which automatically takes baby cauliflowers out of all of your photos. Oh, don't do that. Oh, leave, leave the baby cauliflowers. We like apps, but we also like gadgets. We're gadget freaks, and that's what we're going to talk about in our next segment. Yeah, so the first gadget I've been playing with, um, I went to the launch of the Sirin Labs uh, pop-up store in Mayfair in London. Um, and Sirin Labs have launched a thing called Finney, F-I-N-N-E-Y. Finney is the uh, first blockchain phone. Um, what you get when you get a Finney um, is you get a really nice, uh, you know, Android phone. Um, you know, I like the design. It's uh, it's not that much bigger than, say, a Google Pixel 3, certainly not bigger than uh, your average Samsung, uh, but it's got a really interesting feature. Um, behind the phone, uh, it looks like just a normal back, like you'd see on any other Android smartphone, uh, but at the top, if you slide it up, you get an extra display that pops up over the top um, of the phone, and that display allows you to control the cold storage wallet. Um, the cold storage wallet lets you put all of your crypto assets on the phone completely securely. Um, and then there are apps within the phone um, that allow you to pay uh, in local currency. Um, and you pay in local currency, but it can take the money out of your crypto assets. Uh, you can transfer from one token to another. Um, you can transfer into and out of the SRN token, which is Siren Labs' own token. Um, you know, you can basically do almost anything with this phone, um, you know, as far as uh, cryptocurrencies and, and, you know, blockchain technology is concerned. You can also not just install Android apps on here, but you can install dApps on here as well. So they put a bunch on there for you automatically, uh, things like secure messaging and secure email. You know, there's there's all sorts of uh, amazing dApps out there, um, and you can install those and use those as well. So. I, you know, I'm, I'm still playing with it. Um, I'm still, you know, getting myself around this uh, new phone and uh, checking it out. It's pretty fast. Um, it's got a great screen. I haven't really tested, uh, you know, just the standard Android features like, you know, how good the speakers are and all that kind of stuff yet. Um, you know, I'm getting to that. But just having these, uh, these cryptocurrency wallet, uh, you know, cold storage features with that extra little display makes it incredibly unique. And a nice little touch. Uh, they are selling this for around $1,000 um, or so, um, but there is an education center built into the phone. They want to help to make cryptocurrencies mainstream, and every single thing that you do as a user to go and learn something about cryptocurrency by using the education center, you'll get some money back um, as long as you answer the questions properly. So if they can see you're learning, you'll get money back. Eventually, they, they've said that they even want to be able to give you so much money back um, that it pays for the phone, so it, uh, you can get it for free. You know whether that transpires or not. I'm not sure. Are you getting uh, dollars back or euros? Or are you getting crypto? Um, you're getting uh, you're getting crypto. I think I think they pay you back in SRN tokens, which of course you can transfer to ETH or Bitcoin or whatever. And of course you can do uh, transfers from uh, cryptocurrencies to fiat using this phone. Um, it's it's all built in. It's it's really remarkable. I'm, I'm still getting used to it. I'm still figuring all of that stuff out. Um, what I will do is once I've figured it out, I'll write a full review and that will go up on Grit Daily, G R I T Daily, gritdaily.com. We'll stick a review up there. Uh, we'll reference this show from there so you can come back and listen again as well. I have a question around that though. So, you know, just the other day I had to cash a check and I had five grand in fiat money. I had to go deposit in the bank and I was, I was kind of going, man, I got, five, I could get robbed. Now, like five grand, that's like a little over, that's like a 1.25 Bitcoin. Right. Like the odd, like you're walking around with a thousand dollar phone. And now with the blockchain and having a, a cold storage wallet on there, you could be walking around with 10, 20, 50, a hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars on your device. Like how, how secure do you feel with that? Like thinking about that, loading all your crypto, putting all your eggs in one basket. You know, I mean, that's, that's the danger of any cold storage system, but as with any other cold storage system, uh, the makers claim it is incredibly secure, um, as with every cold storage. I mean, if you've got any of the cold storage devices, you're carrying around potentially millions of, of fiat if you were lucky enough uh, to get into the, the Bitcoin game nice and early. Um, you know, that's, that's the same uh, thing that you would say of any um, system, right? 
but I don't walk around with cold storage. It's like in a vault in a bank, right? I'm like, I'm not going to walk around. Yeah, with yeah, it. no, absolutely. Um, but, uh, you know, it's all there. It, is it easy to back up? That's a question. Then it's like, if you lost your phone, do you have like the 12 words so you can actually go back in and gain all your assets back if somebody steals your phone? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You've got the, uh, on this one, you've got 24 words. Okay. Um, so, yeah, 24 word backup um, uh, for your wallet, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, you can absolutely. Uh, back this up and uh, and get all of that back for sure. All right, from blockchain phones to robot dogs. Yes, being a total techie dweeby nerd, I like to be the first to get the new tech. You know, I, I was in on the uh, the first line of the Oculus Rift uh, VR units, and I do a lot of traveling, like Mr. Travis Wright and Mr. Stuart Rogers. And because of that, as much as I love animals i can't have a dog it just wouldn't be fair to the dog i'd be gone too much and uh, being a single guy here in my apartment i'm like well apparently there's this new robot dog the latest iteration of the sony ibo that uh that came out in december and i pre-ordered one i received it his name is skippy and it is a fascinating little toy but I'm not sure it lives up to the potential of what I hoped it would be. Have you guys looked at the videos of the Ibo? I've seen you. Ha- yeah, I've seen I, you play with it. It's yeah. cute. How often do you use it? So not very often right now. And actually, I'm here's here's why it does a lot of. It's got tricks built into it, and it's got the you know the eyes that are digital that are very expressive. It's an incredibly cute little toy um and you do end up talking to it like it's a real dog i'm like oh who's a good boy come here come here sit down good boy no you you end up talking to it like it's like it's this real thing um but it's supposed to learn and grow like a puppy would learn and you know as it grows to a full-size um adult dog it's supposed to learn your your voice and your face it's supposed to recognize up to 100 faces and i was hoping it would navigate my home my apartment a little bit better uh, but what it actually ends up doing is kind of staying in the same area walking in circles and going to sleep you know when you when you've got a dog you want to just you're not always going to be playing with it but you want it to be able to have the space to learn the space and explore and it just doesn't explore nearly as much like my my um I don't have a Roomba. It's a it's a knockoff called a D-Bot, my robot vacuum cleaner. It explores my place better than the Ibo does, <laughs> and it cleans up stuff. Yeah, I think the problem here is, uh, Joel, that you ordered the Sony Ibo Stewart edition because uh, I also just walk around in the corner of a room, curl up, and go to sleep. <laughs> Digital nomad. There yeah, very excited. I mean, um, Sony Sony Ibo. I've had a long, a long illustrious history with Sony Ibo. Of course, this is the latest version of Sony Sony Ibo. Um, they had several iterations uh, of this uh, robot dog, and then they canned it. And they canned it just before, if I remember rightly, uh, you had the PlayStation Four come out. And and I always felt that. You know, the real thing that Sony should be doing here is, is actually having the different divisions of their company talking to each other. I mean, what a concept that would be. Um, and, you know, the Ibo shouldn't just have an app that allows you to do various things with it on a, on a smartphone, but the Ibo should have an app on the PS4. Uh, you know, if there's what, uh, I can't remember, is it like 40 million PS4s out there? Why wouldn't you link that with the Ibo and have an app on the PS4? So that with the PS4 and the Ibo, you can actually have games uh, where the Ibo is interacting with the PlayStation 4 and what's on screen, and you're able to control it with DualShock and all sorts of other stuff like that. I mean, it seems to me like they've missed a massive trick here. There's some really clever things that, you know, that it does. Um, the toys that it uses are pink. So there's a ball, there's a bone, there's its home base, which it'll it'll find its way back to its base when the battery is low. Most of the time it works. Uh, but if you leave it on all the time, when it hears sound, it'll wake up. So you can't really leave it on at night because if you, you know, start snoring at night or something and it decides it hears something, all of a sudden you'll hear and, you know, so I have to actually turn it off at night. You know, if only you could power down your real animals at night so they don't bark and wake you up. It's a really good thing that the Osei personal massager is blue and not pink. That's all I'm saying. 
<laughs> and we've come full circle. Um, and, and speaking of the vibrating massager, Travis, you've got something that's vibrating as well that you were super excited yeah. about. You know, it's 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 interesting. So, so I was in L.A. I don't know a couple months ago, and I ran it. I was uh, it was a pre. Uh, Burning Man uh, event, and there was this dude there. He's a he's a doctor, and um, he has this bed that has speakers built into it, and he has a. It was just really cool. This thing it's he's called a bioharmonic technology. It's the Vibe three point one, and what it is, it's a bed that is that has all these speakers built into it, and it has an amp connected, and then you connect your tablet. Uh, with all these various different songs and, and waves and vibrations, sort of like, you know, Solfigio frequencies are located in there. You have, you know, theta waves, beta, alpha waves, delta waves, gamma waves. And so you're able to lay on this bed and meditate. And it's unbelievable. And like when you when bass kicks in the songs you can play, you know, I, I, I added um, Spotify to the tablet and some other some of my own favorite music that I really like some Hemi sync stuff which is some bio uh, uh, binaural beats which music is playing on both sides of the ears but what's so wild is when this music and these and these it, oh, classical music is unbelievable so basically you're laying on this bed on top of all these different subwoofers and speakers and listening to the music in your ears and feeling it on the bed you're basically getting yourself a sound you know massage and it is unbelievable and uh, that's by Bioharmonic Technologies, and um, it's <laughs> it's it's crazy. How much are they, it. Travis? I think the full on editions are going depending on one. There's there's like a lower level one, and there's the higher level one. And uh, he's creating some brand new ones, and I think they're anywhere between three and five grand, depending on which model you get. But I tell you what, it's just like getting a massage. I got up after listening to some music and feeling the music. I was just like, oh, my God, that is unbelievable. It's about the price of a Bitcoin. So right you now. can have a vibrating massage table or a dog that walks in circles. Or a vibrating dildo that's robotic. And, and just, you know, just uh, yeah, throwing it out there because, um, you know, I, I have mentioned before the whole uh, technology for the sake of it as opposed to solving any real problems. But uh, why is three thousand dollars better than going and getting a really good 60 dollar massage well you know what because it's in my house and it's amazing and i love the fact that you know especially when you're throwing in some of the spiritual music and some of the you know sophisio frequencies and various different tones that you're vibrating every cell in your body and there's some really cool cleansing to that and there's some other science behind that all I know is whenever I laid on it for like five to 10 minutes in LA, I was like, oh yes, I have to have one of these. This is amazing. And another thing that's really cool about it is that once I put it up, both of my kids last night, it arrived yesterday, both of my kids, like they hung out here all night listening to their favorite music, jamming out and laying on, like, it's cool. I can tell my kids are going to hang out more downstairs here with me while I'm working on stuff. And, uh, it, it, it feels amazing. Once you feel it, then you know. You know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go along with Stuart for a moment because uh, I like to give you crap, but I can get a massage in my home too. In fact, I use a service called Zeal, and right. it's an app. And I just I click on it uh, and say, I want a massage. I want it, uh, a male or a female. I want this kind of massage. I want it this date, this time. And I click swipe. And uh, because I subscribe to their service, it's a, a, a one-year service, they actually sent me a massage table that's like a 250 or $300 massage table that I have here in my home. So I don't have to leave and I put on music, but I don't feel the vibrations. You don't sleep on a, on a wall of sound. So no, but, you know, if you, if you want all this for free, um, if you just lay down for long enough anywhere in Los Angeles, eventually you'll get an earthquake and, and you get a massage. Down. <laughs> <laughs> One last piece of tech that I want to bring to you guys here before we wrap up. And I discovered this at CES. There was a lot of uh, health and fitness technology there. And everybody's now, you know, got a wearable, a band that you put on your wrist that tracks your sleep patterns and uh, how many calories you're burning, your stress levels and so on. But there was one in particular that stood out from the rest by a company called Heal B, H-E-A-L-B-E.com. And the smart band is called the Go B2. It's the number two. And this band does all of those things, but it does one 
one more thing that blew me away. It tracks your caloric intake without inputting anything that you are eating into the device. You eat it and it tracks it with 90% accuracy. Don't tell me, don't ask me how to explain how it works. I just know that they claim it does. And it's called Go B. Go B2, G-O-B-E. Go B2. That's amazing. So so after you've eaten your starter and then you've eaten your main course, um, you'll be eating a Gobi Desert. Oh my gosh, that may be the worst joke that I've ever heard, not just on this show. <laughs> what, one thing that looks cool about it is though it actually tracks how – how much water is in your system like and how how dehydrated you are that's kind of handy the thing is really big and bulky though and uh, it's kind of ugly it's not the prettiest thing but basically you eat or drink something and then um through you know enzymes break down the food and the duration of the digestion process you know is going to be dependent upon what you eat and how fast your metabolism is uh so the glucose rises cells absorb it and then the gobi 2 uses this thing called a bioimpedance sensor and it determines the movement of the glucose through your system and can estimate wow. caloric burn and so the reason they they know this works is because they've tested it and they said all right we're gonna these people are gonna wear it they're gonna eat this many calories and then we're gonna see what the go b2 says and again they said 90 percent accuracy um on this thing so i'm gonna be trying it and letting you guys know if it actually does work i'm, I'm actually intrigued by that um you know back in the day um, i was much much bigger than i am now i uh, I, I went ahead and I embarked on the slow carb diet that was in Tim Ferriss' four hour body book. Um, I lost, uh, what's better, pounds or kilos for you guys? Let's do pounds. Um, I lost 92 pounds of fat in nine months. And then I embarked on a program to, to build uh, as, a mus as much muscle as possible in as short a time as possible. And in doing that, it was important, really important for me to know what my activity levels were through the day. So I was using Fitbit for that because. Uh, if I walked seven miles, I needed to eat a lot more than if I only walked like one or two miles that day uh, because I needed to overeat in order to um, have those uh, that nutrition go to my muscles right, and help build them up. Um, and this would be the, the next part of that puzzle, right? You know, I could I could use a Fitbit for, for one thing if I liked uh, to work out my uh, expenditure and use this to work out what I'm putting in and make sure that I'm always hitting the 1,800 calories more than I need um, barrier every single day. Well, there you guys have it. The very first episode of the bad boys of tech. What'd you think? Let us know. Write us uh, via bad boys of tech at gmail.com or go to the website, bad boys of tech.com. Click the contact us link. And please, this is a new show. We have no reviews. Uh, we have no downloads. Well, yours, your download, right? We're, we're brand new. And so we need your review. Please go to wherever you're listening to this podcast and submit a review. Let us know what you think, unless it's going to be a bad review, in which case, forget that you ever heard the show. We'll catch you all next time. The Bad Boys of Tech.